it's good to see you all today. And uh, it's good to stand here and tell you what I think God would say to you if he were here. Which, of course, in theory he is, right? Not in theory, but in spirit. Um, it is an absolute necessity that you and I believe in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is a sticking point for a lot of people. So we're going to talk about that today. There was one of the disciples named Thomas. You remember what everybody always called Thomas? What was it? Yeah. Doubting Thomas. We're going to see about his doubts. Stand with me for the reading of the Word of God, please, this morning. We'll start with one out of Romans, and then we'll pick up the story out of John about the story of old Doubting Thomas. But this is one of our, one of our verses from our Romans Road of Salvation, and I want you to zero in on what it says right here. It says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus... And believe. That's your faith. Believe where? In your heart. Not your head, but in your heart. That God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Therefore, if you do not believe that God has raised him from the dead, what? Then you will not be saved. Now, let's look and see uh, about uh, Thomas's dilemma. This is... You know, after, well, I'll just read it, okay? John chapter 20, verse number 19. Then the same day at evening, this is the day of the resurrection, okay? Being the first day of the week, that's our Sunday, Easter Sunday. When the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had th said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And glad is an understatement, okay? Verse 21, so Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples, now there are ten of them, right? Judas is dead. Thomas was missing. So the other ten found him, and they said, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now I want you to look at that verse again. Here's what Thomas has said. He said, Unless I see it, I will not believe it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we want to say thank you for uh, creating us in the first place. And thank you, Lord, that we have the power to think. Thank you, Lord, also that we have the power to believe as a human being. Ask your blessings on our time together this morning. Father, I pray that you'd fill me with your spirit to bring a message of you, your honor, and your glory. And we thank you, Lord God, that you are indeed the one true and living God. We love you, and we praise you in Jesus' magnificent, almighty, and holy, and eternal name we all pray. And all God's children said... Amen. You may be seated. I believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Do you? Do you? I believe he died on the cross for my sins. The Bible says that he died on the cross, was buried. Three days later, he rose again. Has he died any more since then? He's still alive. So when you're praying to Jesus, you're talking to a guy who's very, very, very much alive. King of kings and Lord of lords. Do you believe that? Do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus? Now look, that's, that's a big stretch though, isn't it? Everybody's heard about Jesus. Everybody knows about Jesus. Everybody thinks, you know, we have our theology and all these other things. But the issue is, do you believe in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ? Because if we read there in Romans, if you can't swallow the resurrection of Christ, then you're not going to make it to heaven. You must believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. Because if you believe that he died, believe that he buried, and that's the end of it, then what hope do you have? What, what eternal life is there for us? What, what hope of a resurrection and eternity with God? If, if, if Jesus just was a good man, he's dead, and he's gone, then we're wasting our time here this morning. And so the Bible says plainly, many, many times, many ways, you must believe the gospel, which is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
It is of vital importance. Now, the problem with people is, well, manifold, right? We have been given the ability as a human being by our creator, the ability to think. We can reason. We can measure and calculate and imagine and think and compute. We can use our brains. And if I, think about, think about the, the wonderful manifestation of our thoughts and our thinking and our reasoning. Every school in the world and every class that is taught and every degree that you can get from college and all the technology and all the scientific knowledge and all of, uh, of everything, all the finances and, and, and uh, uh, social services and, and your, everything on your job and everybody has their particular skills, all this massive, massive, massive amount of knowledge all comes from our ability to think and to reason, to calculate, to measure, to figure, to compute. And to, and to put things together and to, st and to come up with what is the truth about how things work. Are you, anybody here familiar with the scientific method? Hear about that in school? You know what that means? It means you get these things happening, they come out with this result. You do it again, you get the same result. And so it's proof that, that your result, that's what the truth is. That's the, the fact. And facts are wonderful and facts are glorious. But the problem with a human being is that we think that we're good thinkers and we count on our reasoning ability and we get so very, very full of ourselves. And you know in, in, in your own life that human knowledge has just grown exponentially. It still is, right? Right? We know more than we ever knew. And it's just an explosion of knowledge in the days in which we live. And that feeds into uh, our human arrogance. Because we think that we're so smart that we've decided that there is no God. We've decided we know so much so we don't need God, we don't need a Savior, we're going to fix everything ourselves and we are the the apex predator we're at the top of the heap and we're evolving into I don't know what all and it's just that is the way that our world is thinking we're so very very smart one of the problems with that is that your brain only weighs three pounds and you're going to use three pounds of brain and you're going to come to the rational reasonable conclusion that you don't have to worry about God. He's not real or that Jesus was a myth or all these other, all these other things. We come from uh, a point of being rational and reasoning and thinking beings. And the problem with rational reasoning thinking is that it'll only take you so far. If I'm left in this life to only believe what I can think and come up with in my own head, then I am a fool. Because the more you know, the more you realize you don't know anything. Have you not found that to be true? All those with a little gray in your hair? Hmm? My goal in life is to become as smart as I thought I was when I was 21. 21 years old, I knew everything. Hmm? Now at 67, I realize it's not even the tip of the iceberg what there is to know. So that is a problem with the reasoning. I can think, I can, I can get smarter, and that's a great thing. That's my plan. But it only takes you so far. And the issue is that we get so caught up in our thinking and reasoning and, and what we can prove and what we can see that we leave out the whole other dimension of faith. Now the Bible calls faith this in, Rome, in, uh, in Hebrews chapter 11. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things that you cannot see. 
Faith is proof of what cannot be proven. Faith is the evidence, the proof, the result of the things that cannot be reasoned and thought out and, and calculated and computed and measured and written out and proven. Faith cannot be proven. Now, a lot of people think, well, if I, if, yeah, if I'm going to become a Christian, I'm going to have to just check my brain at the door because well, those Christians, they don't care anything about the truth or the facts. Well, listen, absolutely, we're in love with the truth because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amen? And so, now, listen, if you're a Christian, don't ever be afraid of the facts. Facts, the truth are just fine. But everybody's got their own interpretation of facts, and that's another whole other story. But I want you to understand what faith is really all about. Faith means you believe in what you cannot see. Now, one day, uh, a fellow by the name of Nicodemus over in John chapter 3, was, one evening he was talking to Jesus, and he had all these issues and problems and struggles. And, and Jesus said this. He said, you know, the Spirit is like the wind. You can't see it, but you see the effects of it, right? So to say you only believe what you can see, well, that doesn't even make any sense because you can't see the air. How many of you believe in bacteria enough to wash your hands? But you can't see it. Hmm? How many of you believe in heaven? You can't see it. Angels? Can't see them. The older we get, the larger things are that we still can't see. Amen? I got to find my glasses and maybe then I can see it. But listen. God says, Jesus said, it's like, it's like the wind. You can't see the wind, but you know it's there. You can feel it. You can hear it. You know it's there. You don't have to be able to see it. So the waving of the trees is evidence of something that you cannot see. Our faith is evidence of things that cannot be seen and understood and rationalized out. Now, now Thomas here said, look, if I don't see it, I will never believe it, right? I need, I need proof. I need proof. You give me enough evidence, and I'll believe it. Well, no, you won't, because it cannot be proven. If I were to say to you, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a bunch of evidence at the reality of the resurrection of Jesus, the truth of Christianity, here you go. Here's your sum. What about all the ways in the Word of God has been proven to be true, never been proven to be false? How about that? How about all the Christians that you know and you see the way that they live and nobody's perfect, but we are far side better than we used to was, right? And the, and the love of Jesus that is shared and the faith and the spirituality of the people around you. How about all that? That's good evidence, right? That's evidence for the truth and the reality of Christianity and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. What about answered prayers? We pray in the name of Jesus, and it turns out that way. This is evidence that Christianity is the truth, that Jesus is alive and well. Amen. So we have all these masses of evidence. Yet and still, as a human being, our ability to think it also gives us the ability to doubt and the ability to take the, the issue that I just don't have enough evidence. I don't have enough evidence. Well, Thomas said it this way. If I don't see it, then I don't believe it. But Thomas is not being honest here. Hmm? Where's Thomas been for the last three years? Three years years. Where's Thomas been? What has Thomas seen with his own eyes for three years? What has Thomas reached out and felt with his own hands for three years? Thomas saw Jesus Christ walk on water with his own eyes. He saw him with his own eyes feed 5,000 families with a sack lunch. He saw with his own eyes Jesus cast out demons. He saw with his own eyes him heal the leper to give sight to the blind. With his own eyes, Thomas saw Jesus raise not one, not two, but three people 
from the dead. When I've been dead for four days. He saw it with his own eyes. He felt it with his own hands. And so Thomas has come up now and say, well, look, I believe, I believe Jesus could feed the hungry. I believe he cast out demons. And I believe that, that he could uh, uh, heal the sick, give sight to the blind, heal the lepers, and raise people from the dead. Because I've seen it. But I'm going to draw the line right here. He made three other folk he can raise from the dead, but I don't, think he can, I don't believe he can raise himself from the dead. So he's not being honest and truthful with us, is he? Because Thomas is really saying this. I have decided, I have chosen, that no matter how much evidence I have, I choose that I will not believe this about Jesus. Of all he had seen was not enough. Of all he had touched and handled was not enough. Three years living in the very presence of Jesus while he did all this stuff, not enough. Smell the stench of the dead corpse of Lazarus and then see him float out of there because he's wrapped up right. And he's alive and well. They just had dinner with him not long ago after Lazarus' resurrection. That's not enough. Now, this is the issue of humanity. God has given us the ability to think, but we choose whether or not to use it. Amen? God has given the human being the ability to have faith, to believe in what you cannot see, to believe in things that are beyond your ability to fathom. beyond reason but we choose whether or not to believe it so we stack up all the evidence all the proof that we can come up with and it's still going to fall short because it cannot be proven but if you can't believe in what you don't see then you're stuck you're stuck with what you can figure out what you can rationalize and reason in your brain. And dear friend, that's just not enough. Amen? That's not enough. But God has given you the human capacity for faith and for belief. So you gather up all that Christ has given you in your life. You see all the evidence for a resurrected Savior. And then you decide whether or not you're going to believe in the evidence or whether you have decided that you will not, that you demand proof. Now, here I am. I'm going to stand before God. And I'm going to say, look, Jesus, I demand that you prove to me that you are who you say you are. If you want me to believe in you, I need proof. Does that sound like a good position between, before God? No, it does not. Did you know that someday everyone will believe in Jesus? What does the Bible say? Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But even before that great and glorious day, when you take your last breath on this life, and your spirit slips out of your body, at that moment you will believe in the resurrected Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. But if your soul is not ready, if you're not one of God's children, then you're done for. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. You're going to operate by faith, which means that you haven't seen him, you don't have ironclad proof for your reasoning. It's got to be done before you die. Amen? It's got to be done now. You have to decide now. People say, oh, when I'm prepared for God, I'm going to make my argument and make my case. No, dear friend. <clears throat> the trial is in this life. Judgment day is the sentencing day. There's no argument. You make the argument now by what you choose to believe. And so... <clears throat> 
Jesus says to Thomas, he says, Thomas, here I am. Bong, there he is. Standing in the middle of them. Thomas, you need proof? You need proof? And by the way, before we give Thomas a hard time, let's just remember that earlier it said that he appeared before the, the other ten, and he said, he showed them his hands and his side. So Thomas is not alone on this. Okay? They all, they all need a little proof. Also remember, at that time, there was no such thing as a New Testament. Right? And there was no such thing as, as the Holy Spirit living inside you. So we have things that they didn't have. So he shows up with Thomas and says, Thomas, come on. Here it is. Man, don't you know that just, de that was devastating. Right? Put your, put your finger in here. Look, Thomas, why well, you put your whole hand between those ribs. Come on. Mm-mm, not me, man. Would you? I'd, yeah, I'd be just like Thomas. <clears throat> I would say, my Lord and my God. Let's read those other scriptures right there. After eight days, his disciples were again inside. Thomas was with them. Jesus came, doors being shut, stood in the midst and said, peace be to you. And he said to Thomas, reach your finger here. Look at my hands. Reach your hand here. Put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believe me. Now see, it's a choice, isn't it? Jesus said you can be without faith or you can be a person of faith. It's your choice. And so, uh, the next verse, I'm sorry. Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. <clears throat> now Thomas got his proof. The other ten had gotten their proof. Mary Magdalene had gotten her proof. Over in, in uh, 1 Corinthians, Paul said, after this, that Jesus appeared to over 500 Christians at once. Also said that Paul saw him himself on the road to Damascus. So they had proof. They had evidence. They had the, um, the personal encounter with the resurrected Christ. But listen to what Jesus said to Thomas. He said, Thomas, don't be without faith. Be with faith. Don't be disbelieving. I want you to believe. And it's a choice. Because you gather up all the evidence, and which is fine. Because we have to think. But we can't just stay up in our head. It's got to get into our heart. Your heart is the seat of your faith. We believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. Our heart is where we believe things, where we hold things to be dear. It's where we hold things of value and importance. It is our entire belief system, and it's also the seat of our emotions of love and joy and peace and compassion, courage and loyalty, and all these good things. That are th those are issues of the heart. And that's where we believe in Jesus. And there'll never be enough stuff up here in our head to say, oh, I've got proof that Jesus is alive. God doesn't allow that anymore. He said, no, you will choose to have faith in me, and it's going to be in your heart, or does it count? Well, here's the way it works these days. You can be skeptic. You can have doubts, like old Thomas. You can demand more evidence. You can say, well, I just don't have enough facts yet. You can do all that if you want to, or you can decide, you know what, I think I want to be a person of faith. But I'll tell you something better than that. In these days, the Lord works through the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes and talks to your heart, you don't have to wonder anymore. There is the power of the Holy Spirit to take the truth of God's Word, drive it like an arrow into your heart, and it still don't make any more sense than it ever did, but when, but when the voice of God goes off in your heart, you don't have to wonder whether there's a God or not. When the Holy Spirit gives you the conviction of the gospel of truth, nobody has to convince you, you know it. Amen? 
You remember that? Remember that? Boy, I sure do. I thought I was tough and I thought I was clever and I had no idea how ignorant I really was, but God was merciful. And, he sent, and the Holy Spirit of God just raked me over the coals and I knew that I was lost. I knew Jesus died for me. I knew he was alive. I knew there was a heaven and I knew I was headed for hell. I just knew it. Not because mom and dad drove me to church and all those things. Not because I had proof and evidence that I could write out on a piece of paper and run through my computer. But the Holy Spirit of God told me himself, I am that I am. Amen? I am the way, the truth, and the life. You want a heavenly father, not just a heavenly judge, then you come to me. And I'll tell you, I remember that night like it was yesterday when I realized that I had to have Jesus if I didn't have anything. And there was nobody that needed to convince me no preacher had to, had to show me the scriptures and say, this is, this is how you can know for sure that there's a God. None of that mattered anymore. God took all the other stuff that he'd already given me, all the evidence of a lifetime of living in a Christian environment. And he brought all that to bear on my conscience and on my heart. And God knows the filth of our sins. And he says, let me show you what you're really like on the inside. And God knows the glory of Jesus Christ and the love of God and his willingness to forgive. And he brings all that to bear on your heart and in your conscience. And God makes himself known on the inside. And you still can't prove it. You still can't show it. But you don't have to. Because the voice of the Holy Spirit speaks to you on the inside and you know that you heard his voice and you know exactly who he is, exactly who you are, and exactly what you're supposed to do to get right with him. Do you remember that, Christians? It's been a minute. Some of you have been saved since the days of Moses. But can you remember what it was like? Well, here's another question for the Christian. Do you not still hear the voice of God inside your heart? What about in your conscience? How long does it take God to convict you in your conscience when, you, when you're done wrong? Hmm? When things come out of your mouth that a Christian ought not to say, how long does it take God to say, you shouldn't have said that? And you know what you said? You know what you meant? There's no argument. You heard from God and you know that what you're supposed to do, you're supposed to apologize to God. And nobody has to tell you that because you just know our faith start, may start with our salvation, but it never ends. And so even today as children of God, we, we, we sharpen our skills and get our, our, our ears turned more to the Lord. I want to hear more from God. God, please let me know some more. I want to learn more up here, but I want to have more faith down here in my heart. And that's what Christianity is about. Now we're about to send, what was it, 49 kids? We're about to send 49 kids off up to church camp this week. And this is what we hope happens. What we pray happens. What we beg God will happen. The worship's great. The fun's fine. It's going to be rainy on Monday, so just be prepared. Be a little cooler that way. But most of all, that the Lord God Almighty, the Holy Spirit of God, will come down on that camp like he did in the days of Moses. Amen. So that we're in the atmosphere surrounded by the Spirit of God Almighty. And other Christians or people, people around you that know Jesus are praising and worshiping. That the Holy Spirit would have mercy on you. That he will show you your desperate need of a Savior. Not of a religion, not of a set of theological points, not of things that you th say that you, well, this is what I believe. But that you have a genuine, one-on-one -on -one experience, personal experience with a risen Savior. Amen? That's what got me saved. That's what will get you saved. Now, the last thing Jesus said here in verse 29, I always like to find myself in the Bible, you know? Jesus said to him, Thomas, 
because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's me. Is that you? You ever seen Jesus? No, you haven't. He's been in heaven for 2,000 years. Did you, did, did you ever put your fingers in his nail holes? No, you didn't. Did you ever sit down on the shores of Galilee and have uh, uh, roasted fish and some honeycomb with Jesus? No, you didn't. This is your verse, dear friend. This is your verse. Jesus is talking about you. He says, blessed are you. Blessed are you. You know why? Because you have not required proof. You have not seen with your eyes, but you still believe. You've gotten beyond your ability to think and rationalize and reason and need proof. You've gotten beyond all that, and you've believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Believed in his death for you, his burial, and for his resurrection. That is your belief. Amen? And Jesus calls you and me blessed. Well, one day... I will see him, right? One of these days, our faith will become sight. Every eye will behold him, including these. It's going to be a good day, right? But until that day, we walk by faith, not by sight. My sight is what I can think with my brain. My faith is what God thinks and knows and has proof of and can do. And that makes all the difference in the world. I hope that you believe in the resurrected Christ this morning. I hope that you have honestly accepted Christ Jesus, that person as your Savior, that you've done some personal business with him, that you've had that personal experience with Christ. And it didn't, doesn't matter what other people around you were doing, thinking, or saying, or none of those things. Whether you were in church or not, whether you felt emotion or not, was not the point. I hope that you, that you individually can go back to a place and a time in your life when you know that you know that you know that you had an experience with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you told him that you believed in him. And you asked him to forgive you. And you know that he saved your soul and came inside you. And you, you know that you were going to go to heaven. Maybe the memory's faded a little bit. The details are fuzzy. Maybe you haven't lived up to your end of the bargain. But in your heart of hearts, you know that you met Jesus. Is that you? Is that you? Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, again, we want to say thank you for our precious and beloved Lord Jesus Christ and for the salvation of our souls. Thank you, Lord, that our Lord is alive and very much alive, very, very much doing well, that you're ruling the universe, King of kings and Lord of lords. Thank you, Lord, for our ability to believe and to trust and to know that you love us and you care for us, to know in our heart of hearts, Lord, not just in our head, but in our heart, to have absolute assurance that our God is God, that our Jesus is our Savior, that heaven is our eternal home, that your spirit dwells within us, that you have given us on the inside all that we need to live a godly and good life. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your companionship. Thank you for so many blessings, Lord. We love you. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' holy and almighty name we pray. Amen.